Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Caring Space Demo Day event. Thanks for joining us on here and virtually for the culminating night of the event. Uh, for those of the folks at the back there, please um, come to the seat at the front. We have an empty seat over here, so please come over. My name is Jack Lim, the head of a new portfolio investment at Boyan. Um, we are extremely grateful to be able to spend our first Caring Space Demo Day with incredibly fine people, uh, uh, collaboration, the colleagues and friends and audience especially underneath breathtaking space shuttle endeavor. It is quite overwhelming, isn't it? Please enjoy as much as possible with our beautiful venue and hope you have a great night for tonight. Um, so we'll st start at the photo, uh, opening remark today. For the opening remark, we have our first speaker. And our first speaker, He's a driving force that initiated the Caring Space program in the beginning and provided avenue where we all could start thinking about human care into space and that we can imagine for the future together. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with a big applause to CEO and Chairman of Boyong, Jay Kim. Uh -huh. Thank you, Jack. Um, I still see many people down there, so if you guys can join us in front, it will be much appreciated. So thank you everyone and good evening, and thank you for joining our first Demo Day event of Carrying Space Challenge. And uh, I don't know what to say, but it just feels like it's my privilege to host this event in front of this I mean, Space Shuttle Endeavor. I mean, it's my first time seeing this, and uh, I would like to say thank you for my team and my uh, partners, Axiom and Starburst, to make this happen. And uh, before we begin the main event of tonight's uh, show, I would like to make a uh, few comments about Karen Space. So. We are edging towards the end of the year, 2022, and I was trying to think of a single word that best describes the year 2022. And many words just went across my mind, and the word for me was supply chain. And there were two reasons behind that. One is for its abundance of usage, and two was for its significance. The number one reason I mean, supply chain is not a common word that are being used outside of a uh, supply chain management department of a corporation. But I find it very interesting and uh, worrisome that one, one day my nanny was using a supply chain word. And I, I, I felt something was wrong. And second, for its significance, and modern day supply chain means extensive global co collaboration. And due to the war in Ukraine and on top of COVID-19, we saw that that chain of reaction just collapsed and stopped working and many people are suffering, I believe. And when it comes to space, we could not let that happen. Because as you can see, I mean, many of you know, many of you here already know about the ISS, how it was built, how it was operated. It was the result of global cooperation, collaboration. And the Artemis itself is a global collaboration. And the Caring Space has that global cl collaboration thesis within us. So I wanted to emphasize on that. And since we are caring about the human activities in space, I was curious about the uh, numbers and its trends about how many people are actually going to space and spending how many hours. So we looked in the web and someone was kind enough to put this, compile these numbers and put this in the web until 2015. So as you can see on the left, 
that graph shows how much time was spent by a person by year. And on the right graph, it shows the sheer number of people who actually visited space. And after looking at this, I was a little less um, excited because what we are betting on is that more people will go to space and spend more time on it, and we should be get ready. But let me emphasize you, let me, let me emphasize, emphasize this fact. This was until only 2015. So we did our work and updated the graph with the uh, data that we gather from the web and everywhere possible. So this is the um, graph that was uh, updated for the most uh, recent data. And as you can see, more people are spending more time. They are starting to spend, they are starting to send more people and they are uh, spending more time in space. And that started only in 2021. And I got a little um, curious about, about what triggered this event, what triggered this spike in this graph. So what exactly happened in 2020 or 2021? I think many people here already know about this fact, but it was led by the um, private companies such as SpaceX and Axiom. So in year 2020, there was um, Demo 2, a uh, Crew Dragon uh, space, uh, space Crew Flight, Demo 2 flight, that was successfully attached to the ISS on, I believe it was around the summertime. So that was the first uh, private uh, crewed space flight in human history. And ever since that was successful, Crew 1 mission was on the, on the same year, and currently there are Crew 5 mission aboard. And only recently, NASA extended its contract with SpaceX until Crew 14 to maintain the full capacity of human presence in ISS. And apart from SpaceX, our partner Axiom, they sent all private astronauts to ISS for the first time in human history only this April. Accelerated by these two uh, private companies and many others, I believe there will be more people in space spending more time. And that's what care in space is about, to care about them. Thank you. <laughs> and since we are talking about the privatization of space, I just put this picture up there to show that it's my office. And uh, it's a privately built Lego space station. And three astronauts. If you can look closely, you'll find three of them. And I built it myself with my son, and my son took part in building the uh, solar panel part. And he's only six years old, and he did it quite successfully. So I, f I feel very proud of it. And the reason why I put up this uh, picture in this presentation is not to brag the fact that I do have a privately built space station in my office. But even the LEGO guys were careful enough to put three astronauts there. And we are here for them. And those who will, those children who will be building these Legos and dreaming about going to space as an astronaut. So that's what Care in Space is about. And we will do this, we'll continue to do this as we go along with many partners. And for our first, first partners, we selected six companies. And I would like to invite them into the stage and to congratulate them on their winning of the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, for your inspiring speech. Now, we will have a Caring Space awarding ceremony with our first cohort. They have been selected as winners among 50 competitive applicants, complete the final pitch day, and have gone through the intensive 13-week accelerator program. After the war, we'll have a quick photo shoot, so please stand on the back of the stage. The awarding will be held in alphabetical order. Please give a big round of applause when each team walk up the stage. First, 
Advanced Telesensor Team. Advanced Telesensor provides non intrusive continuous and real-time cardiac and respiratory monitoring system. For the next, Deep Space Biology Team. Deep Space Biology is an AI and big data based space bio research platform provider. Next, Mylan H team. Mylan H is a new technology software company that provides real time diagnosis and monitoring of brain neurological disorder in remote setting. For the next, Nanopharma Solution Team. Nanopharma Solution is a drug delivery platform technology company that improves solubility of drugs by generating drugs nanoparticles. Next, Vibo Health Team. Vibo Health is developing a tabletop metabolic scanner that provides more accurate biometric data than wearables at a lower cost than MRI scans. For the final, X-Tory team. X-Tory is an XR-based well-being enhancement platform that provides immersive and highly realistic experience. So please let us all gather at the center for the photo shoot. Please stand in the front. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please give another round of applause to the, all the six winners of Caring Space Challenge. It's been a long journey since we began the first step of our Caring Space program and finally met our first cohort today. Until these teams are on the tonight's stage, they have been in fierce competition through number of a panel review process and final pitch day. For those of you missed a chance to be part of our pitch day back in August this year, please take the chance to be part of the day through watching videos together. Please enjoy it. NASA Commissioner Bill Nelson said, rockets runs on fuel, NASA runs on inspiration. If that inspiration will lead more and more people to space. That's why we are here. We need to be ready to send people to space safely. That's what all carrying space is all about. People are starting, starting to think about how do we live uh, in space and how does humanity thrive in space. So bringing all of that together and figuring all of that in terms of bioscience, life science, uh, health science, all of that I think is, uh, is incredible. We're interested in not just this first year, but also how you evolve and how the program takes on more uh, participants, more companies, uh, more things that get flown, more things that help humans on Earth. I want to see how they show their passion in their field. I want to see that, and, and then I can you know, bring that their passion into my research. And probably you can do a collaboration in the future. One of our initial projects were developing extended reality applications to train astronauts in how to take care of emergencies in space. So that's what inspired us to go into extended reality. So it makes a lot of sense for us to be here and try to pitch our idea in how to deal with the challenge of health in space. Yeah, I expect a lot of helpful connections and, and hopefully some really good advice to help us launch our, our next stage in our, in our platform. This is only the beginning and I'm already excited about what we're about to experience with all of you here and with the support I can guarantee that it will be more than exciting than the first one. 
Thanks for watching our pitch day recap video. Uh, in fact, uh, human exploration has been substantial in part of our history, but space healthcare still quite still remain uh, unworld to us. So we pre before our pitch day presentation for tonight, we have a prepare a special session called Astronaut Insights. So we get to hear from astronauts about human healthcare and imagine the future of human exploration together. So I'd like to introduce two astronauts for tonight. The first astronaut, Dr. Soyeon Lee, is the one and only, the one and only first astronaut in Korea. On April 8, 2008, she flew on Soyuz TMA 11 and 12, where she conducted 18 experiments. And the second astronaut is Michael Lopez Alegria, also known as Michael LA. He has recently been to the low Earth orbit for his fifth time April this year, and the latest one being the first all-private crew mission to ISS as a commander of Axiom Mission 1. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Soyeon Lee and Michael LA. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Ella is supposed to be on a virtual with us today. Hello, Michael. <laughs> hey, Sayan, it's good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. <laughs> thank you, Michael, for being here today. My pleasure. So, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Sayani and Michael Ella for being here today. Uh, we'll listen to your insights, which are about the life experience uh, while your mission in space. So to audience, we, I already delivered the short question just to astronauts we'll get to so they can share with us what it is like to live in space and also help us imagine the future of human exploration together. So we prepare some of the question for today. And the first question, the first keyword is the experience. So the first one for Soyeon. Um, could you share two to three instances when you experience health-related issues while you're in mission in space? Ah, uh, yeah, I cannot forget about the motion sickness first of all, because once I get on the Soyuz capsule and then after several orbiting, and even if my flight surgeon said better not look through the window, but Michael already been in five times, so he can miss the first one. But mine is just the one time in my life, how can I just not seeing through the window cause of the motion sickness? So I just look through the window and then right after that, I throw up and, and headache and then really uncomfortable inside, but I never regret about that. And then cause of the, my sight and the direction of my sense of my body is a mismatch together. And I always told my friends, I have all sickness with the bus, cars, on, whenever I don't drive, ship, even airplane, from the Seattle to here, I still have a motion sickness. And all my friends ask, how can you go to the space? I still have a motion sickness in space. And that's very natural. And thanks to my colleagues and uh, crew members, they helped me to release down my motion sickness, but it makes me really uncomfortable for two, three days. And then after four or five days, it's okay because I cannot get out of the station. I cannot get out of the, any place. I don't want to kill myself, so I should bear with it. And another one is most interesting thing is one of my great friends and best friends ever because we flew together, Gerard Reisman, Mike, you all also know him. And we flew together and he just take me somewhere and he checked my height and he asked me what's my original height. And he answered me, you grow up an inch. <laughs> and he just laughing at me like, that's why I became an astronaut. Actually, he's a relatively shorter guy. And he always make a joke of that. Whenever he has a speaking engagement, he always said, I became an astronaut because I want to be taller in space. And then that's really fun, but also really painful because all your spines grows and you have a crazy back pain right after coming back you shrink exactly same as you before and another back pain. Unfortunately, a lot of Korean media, they've never experienced that kind of thing. And then they just suspicious about my hard landing, 
but it doesn't relate with my hard landing ever, even if I had a ballistic reentry and I'm missing somewhere, but because of the grow up uh, shrink in late 20 and totally grown up, it's really painful. And then last and least, not least is, it's a cardiovascular activity because you don't have a good circulation of your fluid in your body. All the Koreans really hate that puffy face because we all have a little bit bigger face than other, <laughs> you know what I mean? Even if I never ate any ramen at all before the night, but I still have a puffy face because of the space flight. But some aesthetic PhD, he told me those puffy face, you, you look younger, but I don't mind. I really want to have a small face. So those three might be the really fun, interesting, but also serious kind of incident on my body. Thank you so much, Fairy. That was a vivid experience. Thank Please have a pause for her. So for the question to the Michael, since your first mission in 1995 and your fifth mission in April this year, what are remarkable improvements in space healthcare you think that still you haven't seen? And what are two main challenges that still remain to be solved? Well, first of all, I think the, um, the, the sort of shining star of success is that we have, I wouldn't say eliminated, but all but mitigated the effects of bone mass loss. So to give you an idea, when I flew for the first time in 1995 on the space shuttle, typical duration was somewhere between 10 and 14 days. And exercise was not really required as mandatory. It was encouraged. Uh, of course, the reason we exercise is that <clears throat> under microgravity conditions, we don't have the normal loading on our skeletal system. And as a result, your bones say, well, look, I don't really need to be this strong because I'm not doing that much work. So they begin to slough off uh, calcium and lose their density. So exercise, it turns out, is the best uh, countermeasure for that because it does provide that loading. And the more weight and the heavier weight you can lift, the better. So over the years, we've been um, experimenting mostly with exercise, also with a substance called bisphosphonate. But to give you an example, when I flew a long duration mission seven months in 2006, 2007, I came back with about 12% loss of bone density throughout uh, my body on average. And that's pretty typical. It's one to 3% per month. <clears throat> so back then we had an exercise device that was really not capable of producing the kinds of loads that we needed. And so in order to make up for the, the, the weight, if you will, we used um, volume, we, we used more rep repetitions. Of course, that's not a very pleasant thing to have to do countless repetitions. So since then, they have a new uh, resistive exercise device. And now astronauts are coming back with very low single digit, in fact, in some cases, no bone loss at all. So I think that is a dramatic improvement. The second thing I'd point to is behavioral health. Uh, first missions, again, about two weeks long. You're busy, so busy that you're really concentrated on getting the uh, mission tasks accomplished. So you're not really living in space. You're just sort of working there. However, when we started doing longer duration missions, we started learning from our Russian colleagues who had been doing this for many years, first with the Salyut space station and then the Mir space station, that behavioral health is quite important. So we started developing uh, first a curriculum to teach people what to expect, to teach them expeditionary behavior, self-care, self-management, leadership, followership, those kinds of traits. And over time, we supplemented that with the ability to talk to family, to have a, a way to contact people on earth, to have pictures, uh, movies, music, things like that. So I think we've done a really good job in the behavioral health aspects. As far as challenges go, um, one that, that didn't creep up until we started doing long duration flight is something called SANS. It's Space Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. And this is where long duration flyers have some, cord some sort of uh, lasting effect to their vision, uh, often presented by things swelling, edema in the retina, some cotton wool spots. Some of those things go away 
but many people are left with uh, hyper optic shifts in their vision. So they become more farsighted. And that's a problem we really don't understand fully yet. So we're doing a lot of research there. And finally, the other challenge is radiation. Um, obviously, we spend a, a fair amount of time in a more highly radiated environment than we do on Earth. We have certain measures um, in terms of shielding to protect us, but we get higher, much higher doses than we do here on Earth. Now, so far, statistically, astronauts do not have an increased uh, incidence in cancer, which is what you would expect from that kind of radiation. But keep in mind that the astronaut population is generally much healthier than the average population. So it's difficult to tell, especially with the low numbers of samples, whether or not we're actually suffering a greater risk from uh, a cancer or, or mortality than uh, the average population due to that radiation. So I see that as a, a big challenge yet to be solved. Thank you so much, Michael, for all the detailed information. Thank you. Um, so the next question is more about a little bit futuristic. So let's just say we have our life uh, prepared in an era of a farther to longer, and we have a more accessible space flight in the future. So as people start to travel beyond Leo, the moon and Mars, what kind of some key risks do you foresee on human health risk perspective? Uh, as I already told you, I think a cardiovascular circulation and some kind of things would be a really big threat. And I don't know how many people who's watched the movie Space Between Us. And then they talked about the baby who were born in kind of space, but doesn't have uh, enough development of their, uh, his heart. So he cannot survive when he came back in first in his life on the earth. I learned about those cardiovascular problems before my flight. And then during my flight, I realized that, but I've never thought about the that real problem happen between those long duration of the flight and then coming back. What if we will adapt in space and okay with the low circulation, then it will be dangerous when you come back on the earth. So those kind of things, I really concerned about that, but it's the same as uh, Michael already told about, several people have a different toleration, several people have a different kind of symptom. So it's really hard to check it out, which optimization is the best for every single people who will fly. And second, I can think of it as, I still remember my uh, Russian instructor talked about when we talking about the space radiation. And then we had a uh, small little measurement things every day in a space station. And he talked about which is the high range, which is the low, and you should be careful, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the class, he told, you know what, but most dangerous radiation is some radiation, if there is out there, we cannot measure it, but it affect on your body. That's the most dangerous and scariest thing ever. But because we never ever can measure yet, we don't know if that is or not. So I think something we already checked and measure is okay because we can prepare for that, even if we don't know the cause. But something we've never experienced or kind of measure or check before, that should be out there because we just at most go to the Mars with the machine, a little bit inside of the solar system, and then human just until to the uh, moon, so something we've never experienced in a measure, that might be the biggest challenge, I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Soyoni. Uh, for the Michael, so in the future, as manned space exploration continues to lengthen in time, and what do you see as two main health risks and challenges that need to be resolved? Well, interestingly, um, I've talked about both of them already. The first one is radiation. Um, in low Earth orbit, we're still relatively protected by the magnetosphere of the Earth. However, if we're talking about going to the moon and certainly on the way to Mars, we have to sort that out. Um, you know, the trip to Mars with today's chemical propulsion is basically a, a two year round trip. And with the shielding that we had on the ISS, um, for example, it would be probably not an acceptable increase in risk for at least a government astronaut. So I think that's something that we really need to uh, to think about and work on. And I think there's some healthy debate going on in the science community about, um, you know, 
it actually borders on ethics. Um, you know, these are people who should be informed of the risk, but they may choose to accept the risk. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to Mars? Um, I wouldn't say no matter what the cost, but I think people are willing to take greater risk for the, the greater gain. And the second one is behavioral health. Um, I mentioned being able to speak to people on the earth, your friends, your family, um, and even seeing the earth from low earth orbit, 250 miles, 400 kilometers. You know, it is a beautiful uh, vision to be able to look out the window anytime, day or night, and see your home. Imagine now you're on the way to Mars or on the way back from it, and you see a lot of white dots out there and you don't even know which one is Earth. I and mean, it's a very different feeling. Communications with your family, with anybody, including mission control, at some point will become delayed to make them very cumbersome. You would have to wait minutes to get an answer to a question that you asked or to say hello back to somebody. So these are things that are really difficult. And I think um, I'm sure that people are working on the solutions to those problems. I'm not sure there are any that are readily available, but we have uh, our work cut out for us if we're talking about a, a trip to Mars anytime soon. Thank you so much, Michael. We'd love to hear more about you, your story, but next time we can definitely do it. So hope your training in Houston went well today, and we look forward to seeing you. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Sirani and Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, please have a big applause for Dr. Soyan and Michael for today. Thank you. Thank you. All the best, everybody. Now, we'll move on to our first the cohort presentation for tonight. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these six teams have been through a number of uh, review process and complete our final pitch day and also intensive 13-week accelerator program. They made some substantial advancement in their business and space application through uh, collaboration with one of our main partner, Axiom Space, and also within the cohorts together, and also some other related space entities. We'll definitely get to hear it more shortly, but before we move on uh, for the reference, we won't be having any Q&A session during the pitch, so if you guys have any questions, please hold on to it and come by the booth. The first team to present their idea is a team is a strongly motivated to develop the first space bio research platform. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on the stage the co-founder and CEO of Deep Space Biology, Montana Bilger. First of all, before I start, I just want to thank uh, Boryoung, Starburst, and Axiom. It's been an amazing 13, 13 weeks. Um, good? Good? All right. Hold it here. Um, and just want to thank you for support. It's been, it's been an amazing opportunity, and we're, we're happy to be here. We are deep space biology. We use the power of AI to accelerate and increase space and human health discoveries. We've unlocked the untapped value of biological data that saves time, money, and human lives. Trillions of dollars have been invested in the space industry, yet some argue how valuable that investment truly is. There's a disconnect because they might not understand all the amazing advancements from space research. Humans have maintained a consistent presence in space over the last 20 years on the ISS and have conducted over 4,000 physical and biological experiments in low Earth orbit. Specifically, these biological investigations are costly, they have long timelines, and they often operate with limited resources. Because of these constraints, as well as the very unique radiation and microgravity environment of low Earth orbit, there's an enormous amount of extremely valuable data that's generated. However, this data lives in disparate databases across multiple agencies and sites. It has many incompatible formats, it's not actionable, and more and more data is added without any standardization, making the problem even worse. Overall, it's extremely challenging to extract value from this data. 
So in order to solve these problems, we created Yoda, the first AI platform capable of leveraging all of this extremely valuable space biology data. It's essentially the Google for space biology. Yoda can handle a variety of multi-omic data types from any living entity. It creates a common repository that bridges all of this silo of data together. But we don't just store information. Using our custom algorithms, we extract knowledge. What this does is it reduces R&D time from years to minutes, which ultimately reduces costs by a large amount. Using the power of AI and an easy to use interface, we've created a standalone bio knowledge engine that allows pharmaceutical, healthcare, and space companies to innovate faster. The first version of Yoda laid the groundwork for a rodent digital twin. Using data on, the, on NASA, um, from NASA Gene Lab, we were able to create an incredible product. Using data from not only there, but also from the NIH and the European Space Agency, we arrived at some incredible insights. We found thousands of relationships between genes and biological events. We also created a custom radiation model to observe the impact on rodent gene expression. But how does this all work? Well, we take all this incredible data from billions of dollars worth of research, and we put it all into our platform. We then create what's called a knowledge graph. This showcases the relationships between genes and biological events, which is then used to create a digital twin. Our platform allows you to model multiple organisms and the responses to stressors like radiation, microgravity, or chemical and biological agents. Yoda's predictive ability allows researchers to understand how something happens from A to B in the biological happenings of, an, of, an, of a being. Our long-term plan is to house Yoda in orbit to use it data as a service to provide immediate data insights to space experiments and improve them on the fly. We're actually currently working on implementing Yoda in space on the ISS with Axiom as an implementation partner. Yoda has captured the attention of many institutions and companies. In fact, we have a signed LOI with a principal investigator from Mayo Clinic to study non-alcoholic fatty liver disease using our platform and look at commercial opportunities in the future. We also have a signed LOI from IDDK to explore putting Yoda on their satellite laboratories. Our business model has been designed to create a steady stream of ongoing revenue, led with recurrent licenses, fees for analytics, and fees for shared intellectual property, depending on the project or the company. Also, as mentioned earlier, we'll use Yoda as a service in orbit to help improve the experimentation process in space. And lastly, we'll resell to our customers other AI modules that, in, that are seamlessly integrated into Yoda and their data pipelines. Our multifaceted business model is capable of capturing the market before us. According to Starburst Aerospace's market research, there is a growing $675 billion space market. And inside that market, the AI and biotech markers are around 75 billion. We are going to be a major player in this market. Other companies are using AI for health discoveries, but they're focused on a specialized niche. So far today, we are the first company to leverage this extremely valuable space biology data for human health discoveries. And actually, we see our competitors as potential partners because we seek to incorporate other AI modules into our platform as well. 
Part of what makes Yoda so unique is our journey, where we've come from and where we're headed. Our company began at the Masters of Science and Analytics program at Georgia Tech in 2021. There, the other co-founders and I, while working on a group project, saw the needs of space biology. So eager to dive deeper and talk to the experts, we did what any logical person would do, spam email a bunch of NASA scientists. <laughs> Upon receiving an automatic out of office email reply with a Zoom link in it, we invited ourselves to a NASA AI for Life in Space committee meeting. We then pitched our project, and then for the last 19 months, with the collaboration of NASA Gene Lab, have been working to fill the gaps in the fields of multiomics research and space biology research. Along the way, we've had our fair share of successes. We were accepted into and completed Georgia Tech's Startup Accelerator Program, CreateX, in the summer of 2022. We were also one of the six winners of the Care in Space Challenge hosted by Boryoung, and have finished the accompanied 13-week accelerator program with Starburst Aerospace and Axiom Space. While in the program, we've accomplished a lot. We completed our second generation of our Yoda platform. We refined our business strategy. We brought amazing talent onto the team. We've obtained multiple signed agreements with potential commercial partners. We started a pilot program with Mayo Clinic. And we're exploring, exploring pilot terms with Axiom Space. In the near term, members of Deep Space Biology have been asked to speak at the Leap Technology Conference in Saudi Arabia in 2023. There, we'll also meet with members of the Saudi Space Commission and other international uh, investors and partners. We're also looking to become a NASA certified provider and have multiple patents in process. But you don't just care about the product, though. You care about the people behind the product. Do they have the passion, the grit, and the experience to deliver? Our full-time, highly qualified team most definitely does. All three co-founders, including myself, have a master's in analytics from Georgia Tech. I also have a bachelor's in physics from West Point, and experience as an army officer leading incredible teams, and in data science at Nike and at BetterUp. Michael, our chief bioinformatics officer, has a PhD in biology, was a researcher and professor at Harvard Medical School, and he started his own biology company that he ran for 15 years, Levin Inc. Guillermo, our COO, has a bachelor's in biochemistry. He's also a member of the NASA AI for Life in Space Committee. Yes, the same one we barged in on two years ago. Uh, and he co-founded Voxiva AI in 2000 and has deployed analytics health solutions in over 19 countries. And last but not least, Kimberly, our executive vice president, president, has over 20 years of experience as an entrepreneur in international business, focuses on wellness and technology. She also started her own nonprofit, Space for Girls, and is a proud member of SpaceKind. We've completed our pre-seed round and are currently raising $2.5 million in our seed round. We'll use these funds to fully operationalize Yoda 3.0, a human digital twin, to establish the infrastructure to finish more pilot programs, complete our patent filings to protect our IP, speed up our time to market, and continue to build out an all-star team. We've created the first AI platform that can leverage space biology data so that any researcher, company, or institution can revolutionize the field of biology. The time is now. Deep space biology is currently moving at light speed. We're looking for partners and investors who want to help unlock the future of space and healthcare with us. Our rocket ship's launching, and I promise you, you don't want to get left behind. One of the first companies to leverage knowledge relationships to disrupt an industry was Google. And I know there's lots of people who wish they would have had the opportunity to invest there at an early stage. Come stop by our booth to see Yoda in action and contact us. Scan our QR code behind me for more information and email me at mbilger at deepspace.bio. Thank you very much.
have someone on stage to team that envision to advance human performance in extreme environments such as space. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on the stage co-founder of Xtory, Rodrigo Segura. Mic check, mic check, that's how we do it. All right. Hello, everyone. We are Xtory, the first generative artificial intelligence extended reality platform for space. We're helping non-specialists to create amazing immersive content. Through our technology, we expedite the creation of extended reality experiences, and we distribute them using our streaming service and our marketplace. And for the Star, Star Trek, oh, sorry, for the Star Trek geeks out there, <laughs> we are creating the holodeck, finally. So everything started in 2019 when I was visiting um, Stratus Simulation Center out of uh, Harvard Medical School. I was visiting Roger Diaz, my now co-CEO, <laughs> and his team. Um, and they just got a grant from NASA and Trish. And with that grant, they were able to recreate physically the clinical bay of the ISS at the Strata Simulation Center. And they were training astronauts going to deep space mission, teaching them space medicine. I can get tired of this time. Oh, space medicine, so, such a cool thing. So then they told me that out of the uh, more than 60 years of space exploration, NASA had cataloged around 100 scenarios, clinical scenarios, that if your team, if your crew are ready to act on spot for those 100 scenarios, the most probable outcome for you would be survival. Yeah, space is kind of a nasty place, right? <laughs> anyway, so they told me, we have two problems. First problem, how can we recreate that experience immersively? Second problem, we want one day to create those 100 scenarios for NASA. Well, as for the first part of the problem, I wasn't too much worried about it. I, back then in 2019, I already had directed and produced about 300 VR commercials, two feature films in VR, even winning an award for one of them. So I thought, yeah, that part is covered. Let's go to the next part. How can we create immersive content at scale? And the answer for that is generative AI. Generative AI can, what is generative AI? It's an artificial intelligence that can create novel content. With generative AI, we would be able to recreate those 100 scenarios for NASA, but not only that, um, also any, let's say, future menace scenario for future missions. So imagine a mission deploy on Mars with minimum communication with mission control. With generative AI, we then can create a new training for a new skill or a just to start just-in-time training. Okay. So how we tackle this problem? We started by creating a tool that helped us to expedite the play-to-play. Play-to-play -play is what happens between two actions in, in, uh, in immersive content. In our first iteration, we were able to create a very complex immersive content, not only for NASA, but also for DOD in a matter of hours. Then we use our experience streaming platform in our marketplace, and we made those experiences available to anyone, anywhere, in any device. In our second iteration, our plan is to continue to be using generative AI to this time creating also the 3D assets that we needed. So how we do it? Um, basically, our uh, technology works in the cloud or on-premise. We use web-based simple login tools and web interface. We get in, you create your login account, you start creating your first immersive scenario with our editor tool. Then you preview it using our player. And finally, you publish it using our streaming service. 
go back, okay. So yes, we help non-specialists to create any sort of content. But specifically for space, we're helping on performance training, mental health coaching, and autonomous decisions. We are aligned with NASA's Human Research World Map. The market opportunity for Xtor is huge. The space, it's almost a trillion dollar economy. There are 77 space agencies out there, and in the near future, four private operated space stations. But we also see a huge market fit for Xtor on the creative economy, which is booming right now. According to Sequoia's report, generative market, generative AI has the potential to generate a trillion dollars in economic value. And according to McKinsey's report on the metaverse, by 2030, metaverse will have an economic impact of $5 trillion. When we see our competitive landscape, there's a, clearly, there's a clear rift between human-based tools for creation and AI-based tools. Do you know that 1% of all the content in the world today is created by an AI? So according to Gartner Group, by 2025, that will be up to 10%. And just to give you a glimpse how hot is this market today, <laughs> as you wouldn't know that, uh, Jasper, which is an AI marketing tool, raised $125 million at $1.5 billion valuation last month. So our team is comprised of four veterans in VR and health. I am Rodrigo Cerqueira, the co-CEO. I am a film director more than 25 years of experience in interactive and digital media. My co-CEO, Roger Diaz, is an assistant professor at uh, Harvard Medical School and director of research and innovation at Stratus. Mari Esan Abiyuni is our co-founder, former Apple XR engineer with a PhD in computer science and human uh, computer interaction. And finally, Mari Abnali, also, also co-founder, is our XR developer uh, and research scientist at Stratus. We are a spin-off from Harvard Medical School and Mass General Brigham. We were uh, grant recipients from NASA and DOD, accelerated by MIT i -Corps last year and NSF, early this year by Harvard Innovation Labs, and more recently by Starburst and Karen Space Challenge. Thank you so much, guys. Our pilot, um, our pilot platform, um, sorry, our platform will be piloting on uh, uh, next February this year by Manoli Educação in Brazil. And Manoli is one of the biggest medical publishers in Latin America. Okay. So our business model is based on licensing our XR editor and our uh, XR streaming uh, service and technology to space agencies, space agencies, military agencies, organizations, and also individuals. Also on profit sharing on our marketplace. We um, made a custom discovery last year, um, and we realized that for content creation specifically, there were two much needed tools. It was automation and scalability. We then prototype our streaming technology to uh, tackle one of those problems, and we created our first minimal viable product by June this year. We're piloting our solution uh, next February, and product launch, fingers crossed, Q3 next year. With development, you just never know, but Q3. So we close our uh, pre-seed uh, with the huge help of Boryang, and we're planning for our seed round starting next year. But more importantly, our company seeks visionary VCs, people that think like us, to help us to accomplish our midterm goals. But once we raise our seed round, we're going to be using this capital to expand our development team, also build our X Story version 2, which will help us to automate the creation of scenes, actors, worlds, and also on much needed hardware to um, train our data sets and our AI models. So we're looking for a meeting mind-like 
investors and my life partners. So come to our booth and let us um, show you how we believe artificial intelligence will play a major role on content creation for the next years and how XStory is part of that future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. Now, before we continue our pitches, we've prepared another insightful session. The next speaker is a seasoned aerospace executive and investor. There's a little behind the story. His love for space actually started here in California Science Center, where he, sh where he took rocketry class in his age of seven. And now he's his chief investment officer of Axiom Space. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Amir Plamen. Do you guys, do, you, do some people in here know how this whole evening started, right? Um, and, uh, and like a lot of great things that happen, uh, it started with an idea. The idea happened when Jay visited NASA Johnson Space Center a few years ago, and he saw people going to space, and he saw what NASA is doing, what the future is in, uh, in human spaceflight, but he saw that there was something limited and missing, and he said, that, you know, only these superhuman, super healthy astronauts are going to space, why don't we open this up to a broader community, to anybody to go to space, whether you're sick or healthy, um, and let's make sure that when people go to space, if they get sick in space, that they can continue living in space. And so he reached out to the folks at Starburst, and started asking around who are the right partners to work with and how do we make this thing a reality. Uh, came up with this idea of a, uh, of a, of a challenge, of a competition, and, um, and one thing led to another, and that's what brought us all here tonight. If you want to go back further than that, and where Jay started, that's his mom right there, and uh, <laughs> that's a whole different story, but, uh, but thank you to the Kim family for um, supporting Axiom from a corporate side, from a personal side, uh, for creating awareness among all these people of what we can do in space. Um, thank you to our partner Starburst and, uh, and to Neventa, or uh, one of our backers right here, Wissam. Um, thank you also to Tracy and Rachel from the Axiom team and to Elizabeth and team from, uh, from, from the Starburst site. I can't tell you how much has gone into making this event happen and this competition happened, and just everything has, has run impeccably. Very, I'm very, very impressed. So, um, great job. And it <laughs> and, and personally, Jack, just you mentioned something in my bio that I haven't thought about for a while. There's two really personal things for me here in this room. Um, you said that I took classes at the California Science Center when I was a kid, starting when I was seven years old. This place, this museum that you're in, used to be called the, um, uh, the Museum of Science and Industry before it became the California Science Center. And, uh, and, and we lived on the border of the city in the valley and my mom used to drive me here in the afternoons on the weekends and I would take rocketry classes and chemistry classes here from when I was a little kid and that sparked in me all sorts of ideas and things and, and really gave me um, the seeds for the love of, of what we do. And I'm gonna uh, fold some of that passion in when I talk with you. Also, another thing in this room is that Right there, the Endeavor. Nobody's talked about the white elephant in the room. And, uh, and so I, I, have, I have four friends who've, who flew on that space shuttle to space, which is pretty incredible. And uh, I think Sandy Magnus was, was going to be here tonight, couldn't, unfortunately, but she was a fifth who flew on that as well. Three of those friends are now Axiom employees. Uh, one is our chief astronaut, one is our commander of AX-1, and one is our chief of safety. So. Uh, a lot of meaning happening uh, personally in, in this room. Very, very exciting, and, uh, and, and I'm happy to be here and share this with you. So I was asked to talk about the pathway for human habitation in space, and there's so many aspects to talk about in this, but I'm going to start with just a bit of history. Um, first of all, 1961, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin is the first human in space on an Earth's orbit, and uh, if you ever want to celebrate Yuri, then Loretta's right there, and she can tell you the best ways to celebrate uh, Yuri every year. Uh, 1965, Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov is the first to do a spacewalk. You saw Mike L.A. before, he's the U.S. record holder for spacewalks. He's been outside the space station for 67 hours, um, following in, in Leonov's footsteps. Um, 
1968, Frank Borman, Jim Lavelle, and Bill Anders orbited the moon, and they took that photo, the famous Earth's Rise photo, and they said, we came all the way here just to discover ourselves. Very uh, iconic moment. 1969, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong land on the moon, and there is Neil's uh, footstep, which we all know. 1973 to 79, NASA sends up Skylab, and we start seeing people living in space in this bigger environment and starting to learn what it is to shower in space and to uh, do exercise in space. And we started to get the seeds of understanding uh, what it means to meet in space. And, uh, and Skylab clocked a total of 171 people days in space, in orbit. Um, from 1986 to 2001, the Russian Mir space station orbited Earth. And in that time, we clocked 4,592 people days in space. So we're starting to see an uptick in human activity in space. Over the last 22 years, so think about this. Everybody who is 22 years old today, from the moment they were born, from the first breath they took, there's always been somebody in space. So they're the first space generation. 8,352 people days on the International Space Station so far, 263 astronauts visited. I don't think a lot of people understand really how much life has, has been going on in space, and, and we've really just started. And, and so what this chart shows you is, um, is how the, uh, the, the density of missions has increased over time more and more and more and more. Um, you can see the, the black line kind of at the center bottom there, that's the International Space Station. And, uh, and if you look, let's see, where is it? All the way, um, let's see, where is it? International goes all the way up. All the way on, on the right, you see a, uh, there we go, a little tiny sliver on the right. I think that's the first Axiom mission up there. So we're, we're excited to see that one, and we're going to see that expanding much more. What does the future hold? Well, I can tell you a lot of different programs about the future hold, and I could talk to you about it for an hour, but so I don't. I just made a list of a few key programs of what's happening in the future of spaceflight. So um, one, India will send its first crew mission to space planned for next year. That's very exciting. Um, Japan is expanding its space station module plans for Earth orbit, and, uh, and Axiom is exposed to that very closely. We speak with JAXA often and help them with their post-ISS strategy already. Um, NASA is landing crews on the moon through its Artemis program. Um, the European Space Agency is spearheading an international effort to build a base on the moon, as are the Chinese. So permanent human habitation on the moon. Iran and North Korea have announced plans for human spaceflight programs. So people always think that it's just something from the allied countries and not Axis countries. And maybe some of those countries are not as advanced technologically. No, there's no mistake. Every country in the world will end up sending people to space. Um, SpaceX plans to land people on Mars this decade. This decade, people on Mars. Um, four US commercial companies have announced plans for commercial crewed space stations. What a crazy idea, right? A private company that's going to build a space station. What are these people thinking? Um, so let's see. Um, I mentioned four US companies are going to uh, build commercial space stations. I'm going to go over time here a little bit. I'm going to play you a three minute excerpt from a video that uh, is something we've prepared especially for you. And uh, after that, I'm going to give you just a few more words about what Boring and Axiom are doing together. So uh, please in enjoy this video for a few moments. Low Earth orbit. Quite literally, there is no place like it on Earth. And over the next decade, we will see global commerce in space revolutionize markets and reshape our perspective of what's possible. Axiom Space is building the space stations in Earth's orbit, the platforms that are unlocking the full potential of microgravity. Think about this. Rockets are built to reach destinations in space. The Apollo rockets were built to reach the moon, but it also culminated in the first American space station, Skylab. The shuttle era deployed satellites and hosted countless research efforts, but its crowning achievement was building the largest peacetime project in history, the International Space Station. At the end of this decade, after 30 years of continuous operation, hosting hundreds of astronauts and thousands of scientific and commercial payloads, the International Space Station will be retired. NASA and their partnering nations will continue their efforts in low Earth orbit well into the future, but not as an owner or operator of a space station, rather as a tenant user. And so, without a doubt, the commercial era will be defined by commercial space stations. Airplanes, satellites, and rockets transitioned from the public to the private sectors, 
and the pattern is now continuing with space stations. The 14 countries that own and operate the International Space Station will now benefit from the new technologies and efficiencies provided by the private sector, by Axiom Space. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley have recognized the rapidly growing trillion dollar space economy. In this economy, launch providers like SpaceX and Boeing are building the railroad to get to space, and Axiom is building the destinations in space. While others have made announcements about notional space stations, we are the only commercial space station company that has already sent crews on precursor missions to the ISS, and we're the only company already building its flight hardware. While others want to be considered by countries for future business, we've already been chosen by six countries, and our pace of progress is quickening. All of this is feasible with our intentionally phased expansion in space. As we grow, each module will drive additional throughput and profit, and this modularity enables us to be responsive to the technical and operational capabilities demanded by the market and at the pace set by the market. As it looks today, even at the most aggressive pace of space station construction, commercial demand will outgrow supply for at least the next decade. We are now building the space station that is the platform for human activity in orbit. We are now building the spacesuits that are the hardware to enable endeavors above Earth and exploration on the surface of the Moon. We are shaping the space economy, shaping the future of soft power in space, and we are carrying the ISS's torch of international cooperation in space. We invite you to join us in turning the next page of history. Is this on? It's on. Okay, so what happens when you take a, a powerhouse like Boryong and a powerhouse like Axiom and you put them together here? So this whole field that, um, that Dr. E and that Michael A. talked about of how you help people live in space and what are the challenges and how do you get over it, it's called bioastronautics. And some of the things that our companies are working on together and some of the reason that we're trying to create this awareness so we get all of you innovators together in solving these problems are in areas like developing the next generation of spacesuits, um, exercise machines that are better in space, sleep regulating drugs so we can fix people's circadian rhythm in a way where they have uh, more energy and better health in space, dietary supplements like adding um, vitamin D to prevent bone loss or slow down bone loss, uh, air and water systems. So how do we make it so we have a completely closed loop so can, people can go on years long missions in space and, uh, and have everything they need in a closed environment. And by the way, as we talk about things, and this is easy to think about from um, the air and water reclamation is all of these technologies can end up being brought back to Earth or used on Earth for big commercial uh, opportunities as well. Radiation protection, when you learn how to protect somebody in space from radiation, you can also apply that to nuclear power plants. Comfort systems, um, everything related to proprioception, so what position is my body in even when my eyes are closed, or vestibular comfort, how do you not get space sickness, and of course in space agriculture, so how do we feed people for the long term. So it's folks like you who are participating in this competition who are going to answer these types of questions. Um, so. You know, Boryong is, is, is doing something very important here um, in creating this awareness. It's really opening the doors to creating massive opportunities for advances in life sciences and medicine here on Earth, and also for really opening the doors to a much, much broader community of people in space. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for the inspiration speech. Thank you. All right, moving on to our next cohort presentation. The next team is a strong team of professionals developing neurotechnology for terrestrial and space health. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the founder and CEO of Myelinate, Zia Tayeb. Hello everyone, my name is Zia and I'm here today to present our company, Myelin Age. It all started for me after my mother was late stage diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a very severe brain disease. Regrettably, she received three wrong treatments. They were completely inadequate for her situation. And this, um, and this is due to the lack of any remote monitoring solutions to monitor disease progression and assess treatment effectiveness at home without undergoing lengthy expensive 
and often inaccessible MRI scans. Sadly, she ended up being fully disabled and unable to walk anymore. On that basis, I decided to take a complete U-turn on my standpoint. Instead of going after a normal engineering career, I ended up doing my PhD in the area of neuroscience, trying to help my mother regain mobility, or at least better manage her disease. Thereafter, my co-founder Samer and I decided to um, roll up our sleeves and we started My Own Age, whose grand mission and vision is not just to help these 2.8 million MS patients across the globe receive the right treatment at the right time and under the right circumstances, but more importantly, we are on a mission to help biopharma companies and hospitals monitor and treat various neurological disorders anytime, anywhere, regardless of patient location. We're also doing this in space, whereby the same technology could be used to monitor astronauts in orbit and help them enhance their cognitive abilities before, during, and after space missions. Beyond my personal story, it turns out that there is a very low success rate in MS clinical trials, and it's even lower in brain diseases. This is, I mean, remote monitoring uh, could contribute to developing more efficient clinical trials in terms of time, cost, and, um, uh, and efficiency and success rate. Um, it turns out that MS is the second most expensive disease after heart failure. It's costing the United States around $28 billion per year. It has been shown by strong research that remote monitoring would reduce the treatment cost by 70%, it would stop disease progression, and more importantly, it would avoid disability. Lastly, and more importantly, um, it's sad to say that a third of the population will suffer from a brain disease by 2030. And as we're gravitating and marching towards sustainable human presence on the moon, on Mars and beyond, the risk is even higher. We're talking about 94% um, during a, space, a long space mission. Again, remote monitoring is key to mitigating that brain disease risk, to enhancing uh, cognitive abilities of astronauts and to do what we call brain adaptation to, um, to space flight. So at my own age, using a stack of these problems, um, using our own proprietary technology, we've developed three software products. The first one is what we call a Swiss Army knife. It could be integrated into any existing clinical trials, um, and it will interpret clinical trials data and translate that into digital biomarkers for doctors and biopharma companies to monitor and treat neurological diseases remotely. The value proposition here is basically we're trying to help them develop more efficient clinical trials um, and more importantly contribute to the uh, development of better targeted therapies for these incurable brain diseases. The second product, which is um, our bread and butter day in, day out, is basically the MS product, which we um, think that is going to be prescribed as a tool to monitor MS progression and assess treatment effectiveness at home. Um, and this will, uh, is expected to reduce treatment costs by 70%, will stop disease progression, and will help doctors tailor medications towards each patient's individual needs. The third product, which we are hyperbolically excited about, is the one where the same technology could be used to monitor astronauts in orbit, monitoring the radiation and microgravity effects on the brain, but more importantly, train, uh, mentally train astronauts before, during, and after space missions. Um, this will prevent brain diseases. This will um, help us build that kind of sustainable human presence on the moon, on Mars, and beyond. In terms of the technology and how it works, I mean, uh, it's a combination of a hardware and software. Um, unlike traditional AEG systems, take, the sensor takes less than a minute. We can capture full biosignals, primarily EEG from the brain, uh, from muscles, from the eyes, and so on and so forth. We've developed different cognitive games. Um, each game is supposed to be played for 30 seconds, and it will assess one cognitive ability in the brain whether it's, we're talking about motor coordination, attention, visual pathways, and so on and so forth. Using our own proprietary neuromorphic software, which is a bit of the ahead of the curve compared to standard machine learning, we are capable of translating the recorded biosignals into digital biomarkers for doctors to understand the disease progression, assess treatment effectiveness, and, and so on and so forth. And literally, the same concept is supposed to be used off the shelf 
uh, but in, in, in space. In terms of the team, it's myself, I hold a PhD in neuroscience from the Technical University of Munich. I'm also an assistant professor in Manchester um, of neurotechnology, presumably the youngest assistant professor in the whole city. Uh, my uh, co-founder chose two master's degrees, one in applied mathematics and, and second one in space. Uh, we are absolutely proud to have Lynette Tan, who's kind of leading Singapore's space agency, wh whatever they want to call it, um, and she's looking after our space product. We've got people from the business side of things um, helping, up, you know, in helping us to kind of move the needle. We've got um, also superstars in terms of advisors, uh, medtech VCs, neurologists, doctors from, um, from Europe and from the NHS in the UK. I've uh, got great partners, Sapienza Rome, Langone Medical Center, which is one of the largest uh, comprehensive care centers for MS, Stanford Medicine, uh, NASA Tech, and many more. The business model is pretty straightforward. Um, so we do charge per patient per year. Subscription model is basically a software as a service company. Um, and then for our space product is gonna be charging per user per space mission. It's needless to say that we're going after a really sizable market. For the first product, uh, we're talking about neurology clinical trials. The market is um, estimated to be worth $13 billion by 2030. Our market strategy is basically we, s we started to work alongside university hospitals where we've been able to generate early revenues within the first year of operation. Uh, but we, the idea is we're getting more uh, traction and momentum would be moving and working alongside biopharma companies where clinical trials tend to be longer, larger, and they will generate higher revenues. Second product, second market, MS monitoring. We're talking about $34, uh, $34 billion by uh, 2029, and we are trying to get it through the reimbursement system, so it would be prescribed as a tool uh, for MS patients. And the third product, the th third market here, which is brain space he health, we're talking about roughly $8 billion by 2022, and our um, ambition is basically to be, to be um, able to work alongside um, space companies like Axiom Space, which is on its way to building the next international space station um, and other space agencies. Um, we do have a few competitors, uh, primarily in the United States and Israel. Unlike our, you know, the, the classic approach of, of our competitors, we don't rely on one individual signal. We rely on the combination of multiple, the processing of multiple um, biosignals. This we have shown that this makes the solution way more robust and generalizable across different patients, different diseases, and different use cases. Uh, we don't do any deep learning, machine learning whatsoever. We've got our own proprietary technology again. It's a bit ahead of the curve. Um, it helps us to continually and adaptively learn from the data uh, in real time, in low power and low latency, which are the two constraints you know, in, in a space environment or any harsh environment. And this makes the solution way more accurate and designed for real time applications. So it's, it's relatively a, a young company. We started this journey in 2021. We've been able to get some traction in terms of publications. We've got more than 10 papers talking about our technology, uh, two nature scientific reports, um, early interested and committed customers have been able to generate revenues within the first year of operation. Um, two letters of interest from Langone Medical Center, um, Helios Park. We've been relying on our own resources, but we've nonetheless raised um, some equity investment from business angels and uh, early supporters. And we do have very strong clinical resu results um, in MS monitoring. So these are some of our awards and recognitions. Um, top 100 breakthrough research in neuroscience by nature. Uh, top 10 most innovative companies by NASA High Tech. Um, and we are absolutely delighted to have been selected as one of the winners for the Karen Space Program by Starburst, Axiom Space, and uh, Borjong. So we, I'm here, to, uh, we're looking to raise $2.5 million. Uh, we've got some committed investors, to around 400K. And this will be used to for our FDA breakthrough device designation. This is Yet, and I'm done speaking. Thanks for having me. I'm very much looking forward to your questions thereafter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ziet. Thank you very much. Now, the Force Kerry Space Award is ready to share this idea that brings remote health monitoring to another level. Please welcome the CEO of Advanced Telesensor, Sajo Bushal.
Mike's on. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Jack, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Sajor Gushal, Advanced Telesensors. Cardio is a remote cardiac monitor. It doesn't use any wearables and, and no patches, so nothing happens in between, so you can actually get your heart rate and respiratory rate without any wearables. I'll explain to you how it works. So space has become really exciting, right? We've heard a lot of interesting things happening right now. Uh, the Axiom pitch was just phenomenal. I mean, it just put me on a different place. And I've always looked at space being a very interesting place. And I got there today. I am 30 feet from the Endeavor. What an amazing achievement. A lot of people haven't realized that. It's just, it's just colossal. But I was also listening to astronaut Yusong and, uh, and Michael, and they've sort of explained a little bit of what the challenges in space are. And I also listened to Paolo Nespoli, who's an Italian astronaut who made it to the International Space Station in 2007, and he spent six months on there. And he got there at the age of 60. It's amazing because we've always thought astronauts are a lot younger, but what's changing is we are seeing a lot more people traveling with different ages and different health commodities. Now space is a dangerous place. One of the challenges occurring is that it accelerates aging and health and other uh, disease progression. One of the ones that uh, Dr. Xiong touched on is cardiovascular deconditioning. Now, what happens on Earth is your, your heart tends to pump blood towards your feet and it has to fight gravity. When we go into microgravity environments with weightlessness, that directionality is, is no longer there. And so blood pools towards the upper part of the body, causing that puffy face. But the biggest challenge of there is we also see a reduction in injection fraction. Normal people would have an injection fraction of about 30, uh, about 50 to 60 percent. But in space, it'll drop to 30 percent. And just said, so you know, People with congestive heart failure on Earth will have an ejection fraction of 30%. So we're trading on some very interesting areas. The other area is the baroreceptor reflex. The, the baroreceptors are used to, de to detect blood pressure, so they regulate blood pressure. But with the excess fluid sitting in, in the top part of the body, we tend to, it tends to trigger other behaviors that could reduce either your heart rate or to reduce the amount of fluids in the body, creating dehydration. So some of these changes are pretty dramatic, and they could trigger various cardiovascular issues like arrhythmia, stroke, or even sudden cardiac death. So how do we protect our astronauts and our space travelers now? The first rule is to be able to monitor. So what can we do? So today you could do crew checks. It could be a daily check, but something could happen, something life-threatening could happen in between. Uh, you can use ECG patches, they're available today, but you have to wear them, and patches can come off, so it may not be as reliable. And then, of course, we've got wearables. Wearables have really been growing, but you have to wear them and you have to charge them. And keep in mind, you have now people in space doing a lot of things, and the wearable charging will just be one more thing to keep track of. So what do we want to do? We want something that does real-time monitoring, and cardio delivers on that promise, with a contactless remote cardiac monitor. One, it's always on, so it's monitoring our astronauts' health all the time. Two, it has an alert warning system, so it gives the early warning in the case of any episodic event. And three, it's touchless, so an astronaut can go about his work with unencumbered from wires and patches, making it safer. So we've seen a little bit of this. One of my partners talked about the holodeck, we're talking about the tricorder, which you've seen with Dr. McCoy. He would scan an individual, and he'd be able to get the, the statistics of that person. Well, that's science fiction, but that science fiction is actually becoming a reality in the 21st century. Let me explain to you how it works. So this technology was originally developed at NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena. It's right here. And it sends out radio beams that bounces off a person and we pick up these minute vibrations. We decode the heart rate and respiratory rate from that 
and we can then send alerts based on any thresholds that are crossed. So what we'd like to do is have this in all the space stations that are there. Imagine if you had that when a person is working or sleeping, continuously tracking his cardiac activity. You can, if any alerts occur, if, you, if, a, if any transition occurred, you can actually send an alert on a dashboard, or you can actually send it down to mission control where various tech, you know, specialists will be tracking every single astronaut that's in space. So I'm very proud to be a part of this team. The, the company was founded by scientists and engineers from NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs, Steve Monacos and John Armstrong. These engineers worked on the Mars rover mission, which is where the radar and machine learning technologies came from. We also have Eric Farrell, who's our chief medical officer and at the UCLA Trauma Center, and he focused on heart rate and heart rate variability in that direction. Jason Zabrowski is a cardiologist and electrophysicist. He's passionate about arrhythmia, and he believes this device can help detect early arrhythmia factors. And Kristen Norton is our space physiologist, and she's focused on neural control of the cardiovascular system in space flight using heart rate variability. I'm a serial entrepreneur. What I've really enjoyed is bringing multiple disciplines together, radar, machine learning, and medicine, and putting it together to affect and transform a really large market. So we had a proof of concept earlier where we did preclinical trials, testing. And we tested on adults, babies, and horses, and we detected that we could accurately detect a heart rate within plus or minus two beats with respect to an ECG. So then we took that and developed a commercial product for general wellness applications, which is available today. And we started pilot testing. We started with assisted living areas where we have one at the bridges in Texas, and we have two large consumer electronics companies that are evaluating it from a consumer testing standpoint. Next year in January, we want to start with the School of Nursing to do remote patient monitoring in Texas. And we are now looking for partners in the space area so that we can actually start the initial pilot testing in space. So the next step, of course, is to get a medical device. It's a 510K clearance. We have already established a predicate device and we want to then target the next growing market. So who are these markets? So space is fascinating. It's just the market we want to be in. It's a trillion dollar market. It's exciting. It's driven by innovation. And there's a lot of openness to that. NASA's budget itself is 20, $23 billion in 2023, leave aside the Artemis project, which is the permanent lunar landing, which will take more than $100 billion. We also have a lot of private and national space agencies, especially like Axiom Space and SpaceX, et cetera, growing. So in-cabin monitoring of every single space traveler is where we see cardio playing a role. You know, interestingly, this particular product also applies itself to a very interesting application on Earth. Since COVID, remote patient, patient monitoring has become a really important criteria, and we can monitor any of the patients with that. This is funded and driven by Medicare's remote patient monitoring reimbursement and we can build a subscription modeling with a revenue share between the provider and ATS at a 51-49% sharing and drive up a pretty large market cap. So we talked a little bit about some of the com competitors, the wearables and uh, patches. They can do heart rate, they don't do respiration, some of them can do alerts, but you gotta wear them. If you don't wear them, it's just not gonna work. So we see cardio as a really preferred device for space and for the Earth. So what we are doing is raising $4 million. We want to be able to produce a 510K device in the next 200 days. And then we want to start deployments both in space and on Earth, and then ramp the company to grow rapidly in 2025 to break even. So Peter Drucker once said, if you wanted to predict the future, you need to invent it. I want to invite you all to this beautiful invention that's going to take place of this medical tricorder which we have just started to work on. It will save lives, both in space and on Earth. It could save your life or your life as a loved one. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Sajal, for your speech.
Now, our last keynote speaker for tonight is a passionate advocate for bringing humanity's space exploration to life. She and her team are designing and building more than 40 projects to make the lived experience in space more tenable, inviting, and even more delightful. Please give a big round of applause to founder and director of MIT Space Exploration Initiative, Ariel Ekblal. Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you so much to Bora Young for having us here tonight and for hosting the MIT Space Exploration Initiative. And a very hearty congratulations to all of the amazing companies that have pitched thus far and are about to continue their pitches through the evening. My mission for the evening is to share with you some insights into the future of interplanetary civilization. We are at this cusp of human life really expanding into orbit. We've heard CEO Jay talk about the future of how do we care for more people in space. We've heard Amir talk about how do we get more people to space and house them there with a station like Axiom. And now over the next few minutes, I'll show you a little bit about the artifacts, the tools, the experiences, and the day-to-day -day objects that may be part of your life in space or your children's life in space. At the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, we like to say that if various companies are working on the road to space, wherever that may be, to Mars, Moon, or beyond, we are working on the human lived experience of space, what makes life inside a space habitat worth living, of course, we've heard from astronauts that have already experienced life inside the International Space Station, but how do we expand that paradigm from living essentially inside a very impressive science laboratory to living inside a home where you would see yourself in that future? We like to say that we are training the space generation, the way that we incubate and perform innovation around these different types of artifacts begins on zero gravity flights. Who here is familiar with a zero-g flight, a parabolic flight? Several of you, fantastic. For those of you who may not be as familiar, it does what you would want a plane never to do. Pitches very steeply upwards at 45 degrees, nose is over, pitches very steeply downwards at 45 degrees, and repeats that parabolic arc 30 to 40 times in the sky, which is why it's affectionately known as the vomit comet. And what this platform actually allows us to do is take students, take research projects every year and begin prototyping these different artifacts and tools that you'll see in a moment and actually building out this life in space. It's the first milestone in our extensive flight opportunities program that I run for MIT. In addition to building the hardware, a lot of people think MIT, okay, of course, you're building experiments. We are also really dedicated to understanding this human need for life in space. And so we pioneered an extensive astronaut ethnography program where we have the privilege to have interviewed dozens of astronauts from all around the world, some of whom are sitting in this audience with you, and understand and glean insights from their direct user experience. In so many other different industries, this is a core element of product design, is to sit down with your users, understand their stories, and build from there. And yet in the aerospace regime for so long, NASA stipulated exactly how it would be and the astronauts met to that. But as we begin to enter into this era of space tourism that companies like Axiom are supporting and growing, and then further space business and living and working in space, we need to really consider care in space. Human health, well-being, enjoyment, mental health. And these are some of the insights that we've been able to glean from these interview programs that we're running with NASA astronauts and, again, astronauts from all over different space agencies and commercial space flyers as well. Here's an example of a few different projects from within our portfolio. As Jack was kind enough to say, at any one time, we have around 40 different projects that we're working on. And what I'm showing you here is a selection of the projects that hit on tonight's theme. How are we caring for humans in this future? Some of the obvious ones, we're thinking about exercise. We supported a novel ERG, a rowing machine that's going to be tested and actually deployed on the International Space Station. We're looking at low-cost biodiagnostic sensors that could be used to be able to give astronauts important information about their day-to-day -day health, but also scale to Earth-based applications as well. But on the more creative side of things, we're also thinking about space food. Can we get away from this paradigm of freeze-dried food and instead consider fermented food with a stable shelf life, 
better probiotics for your gut, and that umami and that enjoyment that many of us get from beer and sourdough and kimchi and other really fantastic um, space fermentation products or food products in general. And then finally, I just wanted to call out this square on music and the arts. I suspect we have many different backgrounds in this audience, and while the space industry is often very dominated by scientists and engineers, to build a life worth living in space, we have this opportunity to create new cultural artifacts for that life. So yes, we could always import up from Earth the things that we live with and love on a day-to-day -day basis here, but this is a novel environment, and the unique design affordances of microgravity allow us to create new things unique to life in space, like for example, this instrument, the telemetron, that only plays in microgravity. So you can only play it while you're floating. And so I want to encourage this audience and some of the startup founders that we've been hearing from to also think about how are you designing uniquely for the affordances of this new environment. This is the team. Again, just putting this up here to emphasize the diversity of the different types of backgrounds that we need in the space industry to weave this tapestry of all these different ideas. Scientists and engineers, yes, but also designers and architects and doctors and philosophers. And this is the magic of the MIT Media Lab the department at MIT out of which I am based that brings together an interdisciplinary team working on the future of life in space. I like to say you're not a real space program if you're not actually getting out into space and launching your work. So we are not just a design house that thinks about speculative future artifacts. We start with those parabolic flights. From parabolic flights, we go to suborbital, have tested many different payloads in suborbital spacecraft. From there, we go to the International Space Station, in a moment, you'll see a screenshot from some research that we had with the AX-1 mission earlier this year. And I'm also happy to announce that I just recently signed MIT's first ever commercial contract to go to the moon, meaning we're not waiting to go with NASA or an agency. We're actually, as an academic institution, participating in a commercial economy, a commercial market, to get our own payloads and our research, and someday, hopefully in the future, our students to the surface of the moon. And this is happening for the research next summer. If you'd like to hear more about all of the different projects that are part of this portfolio and the different perspectives on how people can participate, we're trying to democratize access to space, build this into a participatory future. I encourage you to pick up our book, read a little bit more. And what I'm gonna highlight now for the last few minutes that I have with you is a perspective on the shells that will ensconce our spacefaring species as we try to scale our presence in orbit and beyond. This work was my PhD work, focusing on robotic self-assembling spacecraft. The idea is that we want to build, ultimately, volumes in orbit that are much bigger than our biggest rocket payload fairing. Well, how do we do that? There are some examples of technologies like inflatables, but modular, reconfigurable architecture, like the Legos that was mentioned early on before, that can build themselves in space, might be able to offer us a more agile, reconfigurable platform for really welcoming more material to space and more human crews. And as we prepare to make real this vision that I've now worked on for the last six years, we were incredibly fortunate to get a chance to deploy twice now to the International Space Station the predecessor tiles that have the code, the algorithms, the magnets, all of the mechanical engineering that goes into building a self-assembling robotic system. We tested this with Axiom on AX-1, and that is a photo taken by Mike L.A., who you heard from earlier tonight. So I just want to say thank you very much to Axiom and Amir here as the representative for <laughs> enabling that mission. And in closing, this brings us to a new idea that we have spun out of MIT this last year, and that's because we need a real-life Starfleet Academy. I think the fantastic thing about the space industry now is that no one entity or institution is going to be Starfleet. It'll be a notion that is shared and delivered upon by many different organizations. But we did want to develop this focus on space habitats and life in space for the future. And so we founded Aurelia, a new nonprofit research institute that's been delighted to also work here with Bora Young and the Karen Space Challenge. And we're taking a humanist approach to scaling access to life in space. So this is an organization that works on three different pillars. The first is R&D for space architecture, 
working on things like that self-assembling space station context, but also looking at the precursor technology that's needed to do artificial gravity correctly to address some of the concerns that many of the teams tonight have raised about the long-term effects of the human body living in microgravity. Second pillar is education and outreach, making that Starfleet Academy life real. I have essentially taken the classes that I teach at MIT for zero gravity flights, operating in a lunar environment, and we are spinning those out and making them publicly available to democratize access to the future of space and space knowledge needed to participate. And then finally, a policy lab where we can be thoughtful stewards of the space commons. We've coined a term at MIT in the last few years called the anthropocosmos, and it's based on the notion of the Anthropocene, this era that we now understand to be for better and for worse, the era where humans came to dominate life on Earth. We are about to move out into the near neighborhood of our solar system in a really significant way, and so as participants in the anthropocosmos, we have certain responsibilities and opportunities, and this is a policy area in which Aurelia is excited to participate. I'll show you three concepts here from decentralized space stations that can grow and change like proteins to ornament and beauty and a rose window in space because we need things that allow a human to go into a space habitat and feel empowered and excited to live there. That same sense of goosebumps that when you walk into a really stunning piece of architecture on Earth. And then artificial gravity, this is a far future concept. I think Axiom is going to achieve it in a fantastic way, near term or others as well. But thinking about the future of different spinning rings and how we can actually achieve this. And with that, I'll just close by saying again, thank you so much for the hosting here with Bora Young this evening. We're excited to see about the future of life in space, care in space, and healthcare in space, and how we can support that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, uh, for your special speech. Now moving on to our corporate presentation. The next team is ready to share their determination and passion in bringing personalized predictive health care to all. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Bible Health, Gil Travish. Great, thank you. So we are a health company and I'm a little worried that everybody's been sitting and eating and maybe getting a little tired. So if you need to get up and stretch, go for it. There's great coffee in the back. I am going to tell you about a life-changing technology. We do smart health tracking, and that's for everyone from space travelers to those of us down here on Earth who want to become more informed consumers. Let's find out what that really means. So you know, today we have a bunch of options. We have wearables, and we have workstations that we can go to and measure how we're doing, but these are rather shallow in what they tell us, right? We don't really know how we are. We can go deeper, of course. We can go to the doctor. We can get blood tests. We can get imaging done. But that's painful, expensive, and so we do it infrequently. And when you translate that into the space health environment, it gets even more complicated. Look how cumbersome that, that ultrasound system is when you have to consider the up mass of bringing up things and the down mass of taking back the biohazards and the uh, waste, it doesn't work so well. So is there a solution? The answer is yes. Vibo Health is developing a scanner that lets you go much deeper. And fundamentally, what we're able to do is answer that health question, how am I doing? You know, wearables tell you what's your pulse, what's your blood oxygen, but they don't go deeper. And as we said, the clinical tests can go further, but come with all those other complications. What we're doing with a quick scan, about 10, 20 seconds, measuring a finger, is measuring multiple metabolites on multiple tissues. And as you'll see in a moment, this lets us go deep and tell you things about radiation stressors, diabetes, uh, early detection, and other factors that we care about here. What drug levels we have, do we have cholesterol, our fitness levels. How are we doing this magic? Magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Most of you know MRI from the imaging. MRS is the sister technology which lets us do tissue and uh, blood composition analysis, right? This is done every day in research clinics around the world, in hospitals. 
but it requires complex equipment, expensive machines, and trained technicians to operate these. What we're doing is democratizing this amazing technology, making a system that can be used unaided anywhere, anytime. And that means that we can get that tissue composition analysis without any further complication. This is non-invasive, right? No, no sample is taken. That limits the need for blood work and gives us actionable information that we all need. How are we going to make this a reality? Well, we have a fantastic team that's uh, bringing together business acumen, technical expertise, and clinical knowledge. Here with me today is Ron Stone, our CFO, and Mike Corrigan, our strategy and business development lead. Both of these gentlemen have been in organizations that are small and large at every level. My background is in physics, and I've launched multiple companies. My previous company has FDA medical products in the clinic now, and I exited two years ago to form VibeHealth to make this a reality. And we're assisted with our amazing advisory board, including Professor Christoph here at UCLA, nearby. And we're going to be adding two space health experts in the coming month. Now, on the consumer side, on the commercial side, we are a B2B to C. That means that our customers are the high traffic locations, whether they're pharmacies, gyms, or workplaces. And it's their customers that are our users, right? So these sites host our devices, and they pay a service fee, a platform as a service, because we combine software and hardware that gives their consumers, their users, what they want, that knowledge about how they're doing. And it also means they can increase traffic and upsell. Now, the, the market opportunity is absolutely massive. We can potentially touch everyone's health. But here, I've divided it into two areas. On the right, you see general health. And on the left, we have the projected space health. So don't draw any conclusions left to right. I'll take you through that now very quickly. As you know, healthcare is massive. Here, I'm just showing US and uh, Europe as a starting point and driving down into what we see as this serviceable market, which is primarily the early adopters, the people who have a particular use for it, including fitness and chronic care. And that's a, a huge opportunity, at least $30 billion. Turning to the other side in space health, we have a, uh, a potential for over a trillion dollars by 2040. And as we drill down into missions which we can address, we still see a great early opportunity with about 140 million. That's a very rough estimate because it includes on the ground before and after mission health tracking. Now, I mentioned the competition a bit in those wearables, whether it's an Apple Watch or those stations. For instance, in the US, we have the high G workstations for measuring blood pressure and point to care tests, whether they're the traditional one or an at-home uh, blood draw. And when you look across the board at speed, accuracy, the low cost per use, and this incredibly important causal connection to our health, what you find, we believe, is that we come out ahead. And maybe more importantly is the fact that we inform and make more relevant all of these, because we can tell you when to do them and what they mean. Now let's take a look at space health again. And I'm just going to look at one quick example, which is fitness. You saw a lot of examples of how important that is. We break fitness down into performance, recovery, and nutrition. Recovery is really incredibly important, both on Earth and in space. You need to know if you've done a good enough workout, if you need to do more, et cetera. And by looking at just one ratio, glutamine to glutamate, we can tell you how good your recovery state is. And other sensors really cannot get to that. So again, actionable information, pain-free, no samples needed. And we're going to space, or we're going to try to. So thanks to Axiom and others, we've been uh, mapping out the journey. Uh, as you know, it's a complicated process, but it's very similar to what it takes to get a medical device through. And we see this as about an 18-month journey, 
And thanks to the fact that our device is low mass, so low up mass, relatively low power, does not use any ionizing radiation, and doesn't produce any of those biohazards, we see the safety profile to be really straightforward, and we think we have a uh, relatively straightforward path to space. So thanks to this pre-seed round, we've really been able to de-risk the technology and get uh, uh, also verification of commercial access and interest. And on the ground, we've been served by many organizations, including UCLA, and where we're incubated at Magnify, earlier the Octane uh, Accelerator, and currently the Department of Defense for Injury Tracking. And then in space and beyond, we've had the generous support of Boryong and the guidance of Starburst and Care in Space, of course, which brings us here, as well as the, the help from Axiom and earlier the European Space Agency. And what this has allowed us to do is uh, produce two patents which are at the PCT stage, two further patents which have been licensed, six invention disclosures which can be turned into patents. So this is a very IP-rich opportunity with a lot of white space. We have four letters of interest, including World Gym, which is an international chain with over 250 sites. Uh, and then uh, non-dilutive funding, as well as that fantastic advisory board. So we're going to be out raising a $3 million round in the coming year, and that's to develop the minimally viable product and begin the flight readiness testing, as well as the critical usability testing. As I mentioned, this has to be easy and approachable by everyone. We see this running for that same 18-month window I mentioned, so I'm happy to speak more about that after the uh, uh, sessions. I just want to remind you that smart health tracking is for everyone, from space travelers, which is, includes space tourists coming up, and consumers like myself who want to be empowered and informed about our health. So thank you again, and I hope you join us on this fantastic journey. Thank you very much, Bill, for your wonderful speech. The time has flown so fast. We are now down to our last pitch of the tonight. The final team is a brilliant team of pharma experts with the goal of increasing drug availability. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Nano Pharma Solution, Kay Olmsted. At Nano Pharma Solutions, we make good drugs better for everyone, everywhere, including space. Hi, my name is Dr. Kay Olmsted, and we use nanotechnology to make portable, convenient, needle-free drugs. This is Nancy from Mino, North Dakota. During the COVID pandemic, she was shut in and isolated, just like many other elderly. Um, and first time she ventured out last summer, she contracted COVID. They rushed her to urgent care center and just to be told that she has to be hospitalized, but the hospital beds are rare. So she was put on the wait list and eventually she got the COVID approved COVID drug remdesivir, which comes in the IV form. Unfortunately, by the time that she received the drug, the virus is in the fully spread in her body and she's no longer with us. At Nanopharma Solutions, we are changing that. We are making remdesivir into a nano inhalers, convenient in your pocket, so the first sign or test of positive COVID test, she could have gotten this drug at CVS or local drugstores and gotten better immediately. You might be wondering, why do pharmaceutical companies make these life-saving drugs in IV form that only hospital can give? It's because drugs like Aramdesivir about 90% of the drugs that's coming in the pipeline is not soluble in water. If drug is not soluble in water, it cannot get into our body, which is mostly water. 
like oil and water cannot mix, the insoluble drug cannot get into our body very well. So pharmaceutical companies uh, make this drug soluble by adding additives and force it go to solutions. That is why there are so many drugs and distributed by hospital in infusion center and you probably saw the many cancer centers that's oncology infusion center. And the thing is, these infusion drugs are only available in hospital and people don't want to go to hospital. When you're sick, you want to stay at home and be treated by your loved ones. Plus the cost of hospital care reduces the drug accessibility for some in low resource area and low resource group. At Nanopharma Solutions, we use nanotechnology to make drugs soluble by nanosizing them. As you see in this picture, table salt is a lot better and quicker than the rock salt or sea salt. Just the same way, we make drugs nanosize as small as invisible virus, which is about 100 nanometers. So if uh, we can make this remdesivir needle-free, convenient nano in inhaler form, so Nancy could have been with us today. There are many ways to, uh, for drug companies to use um, to get the drugs into solutions. But all of these technology use solvents, chemicals, and sometimes harmful additives. But we don't use any of this. Using a vacuum technology invented by NASA, we evaporate drugs in this blue machine we call nanotransformer and deposit the drug as nanoparticles. So the end product is soluble drug nanoparticles that can turn into pills, inhalers, nasal spray, and other portable forms. No injectable drugs. Beyond the needle is our battle cry. No additives, no needles. Access to crucial medication is really important for low resource areas or high resource areas too. Space is the lowest of the low resource environment where we can reach with our nanomedicine. And just the way we help drug, um, sorry, the troop deployment to the ends of the world and other low resource areas and people groups. Space is a very harsh environment. We hear all night long radiations and bone loss, but we see it as a great natural resources too. You might be wondering what natural resource is there in space. As you can see in this box, we use 10 to the minus 6 tor vacuum, spatial vacuum, to do the nano manufacturing on Earth. The same kind of vacuum is available just outside of International Space Station. One thing that came out of this Care in Space program, thank you to you all, is a potential collaboration with International Space Station National Lab to uh, try out the in-space manufacturing of nano medicines. We are talking about sending our miniature version of nano transformer up to the ISS and have the astronauts bring it outside of the ISS and using the natural resources, which is spatial vacuum, to do the um, in-space manufacturing of our nano medicines. We are very grateful and excited about this opportunity. We have two different income sources. Our own nanomedicine uh, development has a long-term high value potential. At the same time, 
we have a steady stream of uh, income revenue from our third party um, research collaboration with the pharmaceutical companies. We are currently a revenue stage with this formulation development for pharmaceutical companies. The market size of nanomedicine is huge at $70 billion and by 2026. And this is an earthly number, by the way. And we estimate our share of the market to be $200 million in seven years. According to uh, McKinsey's report, in space, uh, one drug development using space R&D could net $1.2 billion. So I guess the space market place is much bigger than Earth for nanomedicine. You probably know that now COVID vaccine is made by lipid nanoparticles. Our competitors like that, Pfizer's and others, and uh, nano, um, other nanotechnology companies all use chemical additives to generate nanoparticles. We stand out in this field for the nanotechnology company who does not use any of additives. Because of that, the development time for the drug formulation in the nanomedicine is only a fraction of all the other nanotechnology. And one big difference for us is our nanomedicine comes in portable form beyond the needle, and all the other nanos can only make IV, IV drugs or oral solutions. There is a common theme there, all the other nanos make a liquid, uh, liquid solutions. And we can make a solid inhaler, sprays, direct deliveries to the organs. Our team has diverse talents. Uh, Sam is a material scientist who brings a nanotechnology to the table. And I have 30 plus years of pharmaceutical experience with five FDA approved drugs. Together, we pull our brains to make this physical nanotechnology. And we have um, CFO and business development folks and technical team to back us in San Diego. Our advisors bring expertise in pharmacology, neuroscience, regulatory affairs, and clinical trial designs. And we have a three IPs pending and PCT, and our platform um, IP, uh, technology IP is expected to be granted next year. Oops, oops. We have received a non ballotive funding and pre seed uh, angel funding of $1.3 million, including my own $800,000 and my family members and other angels. Uh, we're currently on $2 million seed preferred round. And thank you, Boryong, for participating in this. We are about 45% committed. The fund of uh, this fund will be used to the next milestone of making human clinical trial drugs next year and uh, building, expanding our commercial team. Thank you for being here, and let's make good drugs better together for those who go to the space and those who stay on Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay, for your wonderful speech for the night. Now we'll be moving to our investor panel session, which is the last session for the night. We will have uh, four speakers for the panel session tonight. The first, Wilson Mansour, the founding partner and CEO of Nivinta Capital. The next, Abdul John Hodge, general partner from Type 1 Ventures. Eugene Mokhtari, senior associate of Genoa Ventures. And finally, Francois Chapur, CEO of Star Wars Ventures. So these four seasoned investors will ha help us to understand the landscape of investment in space and what we should look out for 
in the future. So please, uh, come to the stage. Now I'll be tossing the mic to the moderator of our next session. Please welcome to the stage Managing Director of the Star Wars Aerospace, Elizabeth Reynolds. It is so exciting to be here tonight, to be seeing this level of innovation and all the excitement uh, at dealing with this space health issue and all of the associated uh, innovation that happens at this intersection. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that today, but I, I'd like to just start by acknowledging how much of this has been enabled by the increase in capital in space broadly. Um, we, we've seen the landscape change drastically over the last five, 10 years. Uh, this has been partly enabled by changes in manufacturing and computation, but I'd, I'd like to hear from you all, what are, what are some of the other macro trends that you're seeing that you think is driving this appetite for, for space investment? Yeah, uh, first, um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. Uh, if I wanna touch a bit on the let's say mic macro level uh, drivers uh, of the space economy is really, um, you know, the commercialization of, uh, of space and all the efforts that goes into commercializing uh, space activities uh, and space uh, economy, I think. Um, you know, the US, uh, let's say, is the main drivers and it's incredible to see like how much the government and the government different departments are supporting, let's say, the, the space, uh, space economy. So I think this is one of the main, uh, main drivers in, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great description. Um, I also see that, you know, just very practical, technical aspect of it is lower launch costs. The decrease in launch costs has created a huge opportunity to enable space accessibility. And by having that, you're starting to see this complete revolution of frontier tech that, you know, with axioms of the world, a lot of these amazing, amazing companies that are, are really um, leveraging that capability. And as you start to see that evolve, we're kind of reaching this new space era where you're starting to see infrastructure, right? A lot of the things that we're talking about today and thinking about human inhabitants for long term. And I think that's an incredible, credible factor. Um, and then also the support of different agencies. You're seeing multiple government agencies now starting to build, uh, don't quote me on this, like 50 plus, you know, uh, agencies globally, right? Uh, emerging space agencies, uh, different countries. You're seeing that really, really evolve and I think it's an amazing opportunity, you know? Pass it over. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm a scientist and a biotech investor, so I'm going to take the biology around here. I think for, for me and it's been kind of the age of biorevolution, the century of biology that we're in, and specifically where biology converges with technology, which is where we at General Ventures invest in and we're very excited about. And I think to kind of answer the, the kind of the, the panel title, why invest in space? I think, you know, specifically on the bio side, I think the answer is because we kind of have to, right? I mean, we're sending a lot of humans to space and, um, you know, we human beings tend to get sick and we need medicine and diagnostic tests and for life support and uh, we need, you know, and, and I think these are going to be driven by things like synthetic biology, like precision medicine, multiomics paired with AI that has really bolstered a lot of the recent innovations that we've seen. And I think all of what I mentioned can also be applied to us here on Earth too. So there is this, um, this, this great intersection and I think what we've done tonight and what you've done tonight, which has been amazing, is to uh, really start to prioritize the commercialization of the biotech side of this alongside with space tech. And, um, you know, gathering the right people in, of different disciplines, I think, is an amazing first step because this is a very multidisciplinary and difficult challenge that we're trying to solve and we need all the brains and resources that we can get. Yeah, and, and maybe to add on uh, what, what has been said, um, I think w we are here today because of things that happened, I would say, at least 20 years ago. 
uh, when Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos decided to, uh, you know, invest their own money into that adventure, you know, um, thinking that they could make a difference by building their own things and, and challenging the uh, status quo of the large corporations. And that was about 20 years ago. And then 10 years ago, when NASA decided to, um, you know, trust um, whether SpaceX or others, right, and, and give these um, large amount of contract to a uh, um, more risky and private company with the vision that these guys w would provide a cheaper access to space, right? And that's what, what you said now, the cost of launching uh, has reduced and we hope that with, with Starship from SpaceX, it will reduce again and we're hoping that uh, more players will enter into the game, uh, not giving SpaceX too much of a mon monopoly, otherwise we're gonna be uh, back to the, the same place again. But, you know, these different steps uh, led to where we are. And then th there's more recent uh, geopolitical um, um, uh, events, whether it's Russia or China, we've definitely seen um, a rise in uh, NASA funding and uh, Space Force funding in the last five years because of these uh, geopolitical tensions, right? Um, and, and since all this happened, um, in the last two or three years, we've seen more and more um, commercial money coming into uh, that equation. So, yeah, more people are being interested um, in what was happening in space, uh, a little bit because of space tourism and, uh, and Richard Branson and, and others, but also realizing that space is more accessible, um, it's cheaper, and then um, every um, wealthy individual or families uh, can start making an impact and a difference by investing in their own field of, um, of, of expertise and, and we are very grateful to have uh, Borium and, and supporting and uh, having that vision, right, to contribute to the next step of, um, you know, the, the space exploration, the manufacturing in space and, and what else we're going to discover in the next 10 years. Yeah, and I, I mean, Nathan touched on this, but it's when we talk about space, we tend to think about these hardware components. We think about SpaceX, we think about satellites, and we there's a lot of money and a lot of the federal government money that's being put towards space is going to this hardware component. Um, but I'd like to hear from everybody, what, it, what excites you about this intersection of, of space and biology? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh you know, it's incredible if you think about it, like how much it can have, uh, you know, um, impact on uh, life sciences that can help, let's say, humanity on Earth as well, right? So uh, there is um, a big uh, potential that uh, we can think about, like uh, what can we develop in in space when it comes to uh, life uh, different life sciences uh, etc uh, that has a massive impact uh, on humanity right so i think this is a, a very important uh, you know aspect of uh, of the space uh, space economy right um, uh, bringing all of these benefits and technologies back to Earth, right, where uh, it has uh, a massive impact on, on, on humanity in general. Yeah, and I think um, it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating to think about the amount of technologies that are deriving from the microgravity capabilities. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these are happening on the ISS. We, I think everyone's familiar with, you know, biological, molecular sciences, all these research projects that are happening right now um, that in space. Um, one of the things we think about um, as an investment thesis, we're very early um, at Type 1 Ventures, is we're thinking about, okay, if we want to achieve interplanetary species, how do we iterate faster, right? How do we get to understanding how humans are going to interact with space, how our biology, how our physics to this day have been really understood on Earth, right? So how do we enable that capability? So building the infrastructure and the platform to be able to do that is crucial to be able to build inhabitants in Mars, right? So what excites us is really thinking about creating those solutions, enabling research and development and more technologies in, call it like space station modules, right? creating that, creating those, you know, artificial gravity scenarios, creating 
Mars gravity emulating lunar gravity, and then be able to test that and iterate and hopefully get to a place with technology and biology in general where you could start to really see massive, massive improvements. Um, I think for for me, it's um, you know it's, it's precision medicine. I would say is is the is the main um, kind of area that that I see, uh, and I think it goes to a lot of things that we have developed on Earth already, right? So, um, if you look at, for example, how we can well, first of all, prevent a lot of a lot of diseases or or specifically detect them early. Um, there is this idea of multiomics, right? So you keep adding analytes and hoping that your tests are going to be more sensitive, more more specific, and and then what do you do with all of this data that is being generated? You add in multiomics and AI. So we've seen, again, just this very strong intersection of biology and technology. And then taking these types of, of tests, you know, these, they need to be closed loop. They need to be highly sensitive and specific. They need to be um, non-invasive and miniaturized. So there was a lot of this, this work that I think we already have done on, on Earth that I think we can certainly um, kind of change and, and, and modify. And then there is a lot of uh, um, the, the work that I think it's beyond human health, right, that actually still uses biology, which is an area that we invest in at Genoa. It's biology beyond human health care as well, and that is synthetic biology. And we already see a lot of, you know, genetic engineering and how this is, we're creating crops that are essentially disease resistance and pest resistance, and we can modify them to survive in different types of environments. So I think utilizing the power of precision medicine and synthetic biology to me is, is very exciting. And, and then for, for us, you know, um, what's interesting to see is that um, the main uh, interest in space, right, is, um, is to learn more about Earth, right? And so uh, we, we know about climate change and, and how to measure temperature, how to measure oceans, glacier. Um, since we've been in space, and it's uh, with, um, with the use of um, satellites, right, that we've been able to understand how the Earth is, is working in a, in a better way, uh, and how we slowly uh, learn how to protect our Earth um, based on what we, we, um, uh, we put in space. Uh, the, the next frontier is, uh, you know, what can we manufacture in space? What are the, the plants or, or the molecule or the, the, the skin cell that we can grow in space differently from Earth to, to learn and then to bring back on Earth in order to live a, a better life? And, and that's what we are lo looking at. You know, space for space um, is less of an interest for us, but the, how can space I impact how we live on Earth? And, and that's what we are interested to, uh, to invest in. And uh, of course, we could have an entire discussion, I think, about some of the genetic modification potential in synthetic bio, but just the, the ability to truly manufacture in space as well has the potential to change the way we, we deliver drugs here pretty significantly. Um, as we think about further travel and we think about you know, the potential for hundreds of people to be living in space, um, there's, there's some contention about whether or not it will be humans who lead some of our exploration further from the Earth. Um, we're, we're really far from that today. We're closer in technological capability than we are for, in our ability for our bodies to survive space travel. Um, so as, as we look at this future and what we, technologies we really need to develop to enable an interplanetary future, what are some of the things that you, that you really want to see? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, if we want to go into deeper space, right, I think uh, it's very important to think about, uh, let's say, the energy or the alternative energy for a typical, let's say, uh, fuel or uh, to fuel the engine of uh, the different space uh, crafts or whatever to to be able to have this extended uh, let's say uh, space travel right <coughs> so I think this is one of the main uh, let's say uh, obstacles that we uh, let's say need to uh, come over uh, in the space tech uh, industry, but I think there are a lot of initiatives basically that uh, is recently uh, triggered to be, uh, you know, to enable us uh, doing this extended, 
let's say, trips into, into space, right? The other part regarding how the human body would adapt, I think that's it, uh, an important uh, aspect, of course, but uh, we need to, uh, to think about it as well. I think to uh, one of Sam's interesting points is, I think propulsion um, is a huge key factor where we need to see advancements specifically in nuclear, right? Um, especially if we're talking about deep space. Uh, we're looking at a lot of transport systems within space, right? It's one thing to get to the ISS, but if we want to start thinking about lunar transportation, right? Um, consistent resources to those space stations, right? How do we drop that cost? Big thing for us, since we are, you know, we pride ourselves as a venture firm in commercial pragma pragmatism, but also this really, you know, frontier tech driven firm, it's important for us to utilize whatever resources, whether they're ter terrestrial applications, and leverage technology to achieve very, very forward thinking um, things like an interplanetary species. So we emphasize a business case in, in that. And Starship is probably the biggest business case, right? Um, a perfect example of that is with our company, Gravitix, where you're building you know, modular space stations with uh, microgravity solutions. But what they're doing is they're building it using very traditional shipyard technology and aerospace manufacturing, materials that you could, we use every day here on Earth. And because of the capability and the, uh, the capacity of Starship, you can now fit that in there, manufacture it to that, and launch it directly, right? Being able to create a business case with incredible unit economics is what we need to see, and it's there. And it's really, really important to identify that it's not as far out as you think. And I do, do believe that we will be in Mars in 10 years, and I think that's a really important thing. And, and I love the initiative at Karen Space because I think it's incredibly important to understand that this is an awareness, this is something that people, brilliant, brilliant people from vast disciplinaries are putting their heads together to create these opportunities. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I think um, for me it's, you know, there, there, are, there are certain um, issues that we're aware of, like, you know, prolonged exposure to microgravity or radiation, and I think there are, there are you know, numbers of ways that we can, we can go about helping to kind of create solutions for that. Um, and there are, there are a lot of work that we're doing, for example, on, on um, treatment selection here that I think could be, could be quite relative. So, um, you know, when it comes to, actually today when I was listening to one of the astronauts talk about behavioral needs, that, that actually was really, really eye-opening for me because I've been seeing a lot of um, mental health companies coming up in the um, precision medicine world where, you know, um, treatments currently, currently are being just based on trial and error, right? And, and how can we make them more specific? And, and if, if something comes up for you up when you're up there, right, we're not just throwing random drugs at you and hoping that one would respond, but really one that is tailored to your DNA, to your proteomics, to your metabolomics, and same thing for your treatments, right? as we've seen companies here to do, treatments that are targeted and that are selective to your particular body. And there are tons of work that being, that's being done in space right now, including growing cells and organs on a chip. There is a blood-brain barrier on, the, uh, on, on a chip on, on ISS. So tons of works that are being done that could certainly empower um, these types of technologies that I think are going to be crucial for us to be able to go uh, further in space. And um, I know as a species, if, you, if we want to, um uh, be resilient, we, we need to think of, uh, you know, multi-planetary, you know, expansion, right? Um, but when, when you look at it, well, we, we've monitored without the, the new telescope, that's the, the, the closest uh, planets that could be similar to Earth, um, is, pro is at least 11 years travel, as long as we, we travel at, as, at, at the speed of light. And, 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 and right now we are very far of you know, reaching the speed of light. So b before we, we reach um, that uh, interplanetary um, you know, travel, right, I, I really um, w want to focus on, on preserve our planet and, and make our, our life on, on the planet better. Um, and, uh, and at Starburst, right, one of our um, arm is, is, uh, is venture, and we have invested so far in 140 startups. And 
um, let's say, 30% to 40% uh, are, are space-related. Um, you know, to, uh, to understand these, uh, how to travel at the speed of light, we, we have invested in a startup that is, um, main purpose is to uh, detect UFOs, right? So um, that's one of the aspect of how to, we want to learn faster is by learning from other uh, external species. Um, but one other startup is, is actually a French startup and they are in. They, they want to develop uh, agriculture in in in, uh, in space. And as a, a good French startup, they are, they are um, you know they are very big into wine. Uh, and so w one of their first experiment is they launch a, c a couple of uh, wine bottle in space, right? And they b brought it back and they they sold it uh, as auctions to make money and to fund the next research. Um, and then the next research was um, they send small vine. Um, you know, plants, right? And they send it to, uh, to, um, to, to space at different stage. They brought it back and, and they realized that um, when you send these type of, of plants uh, early on, right? Um, because there's no gravity, because there, there's no uh, at atmosphere, or, and I don't know the details, right? When they bring back on Earth, they were able to grow so much faster. Um, and it's interesting that um, by putting so some plants in a, in a in microgravity or in a different atmosphere, they, they develop different genes and, and different patterns that could be highly beneficial on, on Earth. Um, and, and vine is, is one example, but uh, as soon as we're going to start looking at other um, uh, type of plants, right, we have another startup that is um, putting s some plants uh, that could uh, grow faster in, in space, and then some of their molecules could be beneficial to cure uh, breast cancer. Right, and so there's so many things that we don't know and that we plan to explore um, with uh, that care in space, manufacturing in space. That uh, you know, that's very exciting. Well, we're out of time, so we're going to end on this note about wine. Thank you all. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us a bit today. Um, I think it's a great opportunity as we gather at the end if people have questions and want to learn more about what your investment thesis are and any advice that you have for the entrepreneurs who are here with us here today. Um, we'll encourage those conversations after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. all of you guys for joining us today for this really monumental celebration of, of humanity. There is nothing more human than wanting to explore and wanting to go out as far as we can and push the boundaries of, of what it is to be human. And space is indeed the, the final frontier. Um, and we are, we are one step closer to that today because of programs like this, because of the support of Boryong and Axiom and leading this program. And I'm so proud of the work that's been done by the entrepreneurs who you've heard from today and really excited for, for the coming years. Um, the, the future is now. <laughs> um, so thank you guys, all of you, for being part of this with us. And first of all, I hope you all enjoyed for the tonight. We've prepared quite well our first six cohorts and our partner's speech. And thank you all very much. Um, as we actually quickly move from the time when only few selected people go to space, and now, in an area would often say, in an era of space democratization, which is, there will be many more challenges that we have never thought about it before. That's why we are here, and that's how we carry space as it started. So we will, for the next year, we'll continuously go bigger, and more collaboration, more partners, and with more different uh, innovation discovery. So thank you for your support tonight, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And please don't miss a chance to uh, come by the booth. They're waiting for your questions, and we're happy to answer. And yeah, we also have an ending video for the tonight, for the demo day. I hope you all enjoy it, and I'll see you guys next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the exploration of space will go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon, and to the planets beyond. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Care in space is the future, a future where Vibo Health provides health tracking for all. Care in space is a launch pad where the deep space biology team can blast off into the future. Care in space is a bridge that connected the extraordinary team to valuable relationships in the space ecosystem. Aerospace is instrumental in advanced telesensors, touchless cardiac monitoring of humans in space. Going space is a window through which the Mayan HD was able to expand its purpose beyond Earth. Going space is a springboard that pushes nanopharma solutions. Included in space manufacturing of nanomedicines.